Okay. It's 3 p.m. sharp, so I suggest we get started. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining our webinar um, on the impacts of COVID-19 and future EU privacy legislation. Uh, my name is Vivian Suzak. I'm a member of ITI's Brussels office, um, based here in Brussels at the moment, and I will give some quick remarks before we actually start the content discussion today. Uh, many of you will be familiar with ITI already, but allow me to introduce our organization in just a few quick words. Uh, we are a global trade association representing the technology industry. We currently represent 70 member companies covering the entire spectrum of technology, ranging from platforms to hardware, network manu manufacturers, uh, software developers, marketplaces, cybersecurity companies, uh, and financial service providers. We're a team of more than 45 colleagues globally, and we advocate for innovation-friendly policies in the Americas, Asia, and Europe. So after this quick introduction, let me also introduce our moderator, Eline Chivot from the Center for Data Innovation, also based here in Brussels. CDI is the Brussels-based branch of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. Um, ITIF is a US-based think tank working on digital policy issues, and despite the very similar abbreviations, ITIF and ITI are actually separate entities. We are very happy um, to have Eileen moderate the session today. Um, and before we start, uh, I wanted to make two more quick points on organizational aspects. Uh, please note that this is a public event and we are recording the webinar and we are also live streaming it on YouTube right now. Uh, the live stream is also a recording and we will make that recording accessible afterwards on our website and we'll share the link to that with you um, later on. Um, the second point is that due to a large audience that we have today, the Q&A session will be written only. That means that if you have a question, please use the chat box function um, that you see at the bottom right corner of your webinar screen. Uh, Eileen, as the moderator, will then read them out to panelists in the, at the end of the discussion. Uh, and when submitting questions, we encourage you to please use your name and organization uh, so that we can attribute them. And of course, you know, if you are a um, if you are a journalist, then please also identify your outlet um, along with your question. And now, without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Eileen. Good everyone and welcome to this uh, online event. Uh, I'm delighted to moderate such a high level panel organized by ITI um, and thank you uh, to ITI for giving us a great excuse not to go out uh, today. Uh, for our participants, uh, thank you for joining and indeed feel free to, uh, to write your questions in the Q&A sections. We'll be happy to give you the word uh, towards the end. So today we're discussing the interplay between privacy legislation in Europe, uh, the urgent need to, to process data to address the spread of COVID, uh, and we'll discuss the implications the current environment will have uh, on future privacy legislation in Europe. A bit of context to start with, um, to fight the spread of the virus, governments are turning to using data and digital tools to monitor uh, adherence to the rules and track the movement of people infected but also to lift lockdown measures. An example of these instruments are the newly developed mobile apps that track you via GPS or Bluetooth. Uh, we've heard many examples from South Korea, Singapore, Israel, uh, Poland, the UK, Germany, and France. And it's not just location, mobility data, it's also health data. And some of these apps are voluntary and others are mandatory. Now, EU data protection rules do limit the use, collection, and processing of personal data, but it does allow for uh, some public health exceptions in the context of pandemics in particular within certain limits, uh, as well as safeguards. But not all measures uh, proposed in EU countries seem to, to be meeting these limits. Some say the GDPR therefore isn't enough um, to protect privacy and the debate uh, over the use of location data in particular sets uh, as a forerunner to a broader discussion about uh, civil liberties and surveillance. Others have argued that some bottlenecks and frictions pertaining to uh, EU rules and the lack uh, of a common approach for data sharing would have limited the ability uh, of some to, to act in the current context and thinking particularly of uh, researchers. 
Meanwhile, things are moving quickly. And just recently, the um, European Data Protection Supervisor called for a pan-European mobile app. Uh, and the European Commission adopted a recommendation to support exit strategies through mobile uh, data and apps. Getting these things right uh, is critical. Uh, so many questions uh, can be raised. When the uh, EU and EU countries follow the leads of others uh, outside Europe when deploying tools in their uh, deconfinement strategies, how should they proceed? What sort of balance are we striking to, to be able to tackle the crisis efficiently while minimizing privacy risks and how? Uh, and finally, are our current uh, frameworks appropriate to deal with all this? Today uh, with us to discuss, uh, we have the privilege to welcome um, three uh, high-level speakers. Now, uh, one of them will be uh, delayed, and it seems one of them isn't isn't there yet. But we'll we'll manage. Uh, uh, and and just introducing those speakers, uh, we have the European Data Protection Supervisor Wojciech uh, Wiebiorowski. Um, and then Professor Ulrich Kelber, the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information, who should be live from Germany. Uh, and finally, uh, John Miller, Senior Vice President and Senior Counsel at ITI from the United States. Now, our panelists will have a few minutes to provide an opening statement uh, and react to each other's comments and uh, to some of the, the follow-up questions we've prepared. And then we'll turn to the audience's questions to allow for as much interaction as possible. Now, because uh, we have John with us and we're waiting for uh, our other speakers to join, um, John, a general question we can start with is really, where do we stand and how do we go forward when we look at the impact COVID uh, will have on our data protection frameworks? Uh, and um, as you, you're speaking on behalf of ITI, you represent the global tech industry globally. So I'd be curious to know what are your reactions to all the uh, the uh, attempts that we're seeing to to make use of data, uh, as, as I just mentioned in the introduction. So from the perspective of industry, what are some of the elements that you'd like uh, to share with us uh, today? Uh, thanks very much, Eileen, and uh, uh, thanks uh, everyone for for joining. Uh, I mean, it really is a genuine pleasure to be participating in this discussion on behalf of ITI with uh, our, the esteemed co-panelists who hopefully will join shortly since they are uh, undoubtedly the draw here. Um, but yeah, so to, I mean, to answer your question um, and, and really just to, to, to chat a little bit about some of uh, the, the, the thoughts that are on my mind on, on this debate, uh, you know, I think, there, I think there's been a lot of reporting and a lot of discussion already uh, that that seems to pit um, public health uh, versus privacy in this in in, in this situation, um, and, and to talk about trade offs and things like that. And I guess my first thought is that I, you know I, I I don't think it's a binary choice at all. Debates involving privacy often seem to devolve into these discussions of trade offs, whether we're talking about privacy versus security. Uh, versus the needs of law enforcement, uh, in this instance, public health and safety, or, or even uh, other interests. I, I really think that it's a false choice. What, what, what the global fight against the pandemic is a reminder of is that we need to, to protect privacy uh, always, but we also need to figure out how to protect privacy while at the same time achieving these other important public policy goals. Um, you know, the second thing I, I just wanted to mention is uh, the importance of a, of, of a flexible framework that, that allows for processing in varying contexts. Uh, you know, when you, you mentioned already the, the context of, of the pandemic, and we, and we clearly need uh, that as well as the clear rules, standards, and guidance to, to help inform that framework. Um, whether the GDPR provides sufficient flexibility to allow for processing in varying contexts has been a matter of, of debate over the years. Um, you know, here in the context of potentially using location data to fight the pandemic, many companies, uh, of, of course, must potentially comply no, not only with the GDPR, but also depending on the companies, the e-privacy directive or, or national laws. Um, but the requirements themselves, uh, of the GDPR and these other laws are only part of the equation. In my experience, companies are, are eager to comply with, with their legal requirements, 
But in order to, to really effectively do so, they need clear and unambiguous guidance from enforcement authorities about how the terms in those relevant laws are to be applied and, and how they will be enforced. Uh, you know, I think the, the EDPB published some very helpful guidance in this regard already. Uh, but there are other areas such as um, anonymization and aggregation, which I'm sure we'll get into a bit more during this discussion, where I, I mean, it's a good example of the type of privacy enhancing technology um, that is so essential in this context, but on which clearer guidance uh, and, and, and information regarding what, what, what those terms actually mean would really be welcome. Uh, the third part, point I wanted to quickly make was uh, about the importance of, of working together in, in partnership. I mean, we hear a lot about public-private partnerships in a number of different contexts. Uh, you know, here, uh, companies uh, aren't going to go off and, and, and work on contact tracing applications in isolation, nor, nor should they. I mean, they, they, they really the most important thing is to be working in partnership with public health authorities, uh, really in lockstep to, to understand and be responsive to the needs of the epidemiologists and public health officials, uh, you know, in order to figure out what data uh, we're actually talking about um, and, and, and really to put it together uh, importantly. And then, and then secondly, you know, and ideally companies should, should work together, uh, hopefully also when, when tackling a problem of this magnitude. I think the, the recent announcement by, by Apple and Google, which I'm sure we'll also get into, is, is a good example of, of, of that. Uh, the, the fourth thing that, that's really struck me in this debate is uh, just kind of a, a return to, to core privacy principles or, or first principles, which I think are being proven uh, to have even greater importance and vitality in, in the context of a, of a pandemic. I'm talking about things like, you know, um, user choice and, and, and voluntary participation in these apps uh, that, that have been discussed being so critical. Uh, proportionality of, of data collection measures, uh, not only in terms of duration and scope, but uh, you know, making sure that the retention period of that data collection is limited to the crisis. Uh, uh, also, uh, purpose limitation um, and, and limits on sharing and onward transfer of that data. Uh, you know, things like adopting adequate security measures, data protection by design. And, and transparency uh, are also re really critical. And for, for, for transparency, talking about both transparency from companies and, and from, from governments on, on what data is being collected, what they're doing with it, uh, et, et, et cetera. And I think that that leads into to my, the final point I wanted to make just in the opening, which is the importance of, of, of trust. I mean, transparency is of course a critical element here um, and, and, and we can't ignore the reality that, that questions are, you know, are some, have sometimes been raised over the past few years that, that implicate public trust in, in technology. Uh, you know, but uh, focusing on the present, we're, we're trying to figure out how tech companies can work with public authorities to most effectively protect the health and safety of citizens in the face of this public health crisis while also protecting their privacy. So, you know, while the focus of this uh, global moment is appropriately on fighting a global pandemic, this moment is also unmistakably, uh, I think, representative of an opportunity to, to, to deepen trust uh, and, and, and to, in some instances, build it, you know, not only in technology and in innovation and in using data for good, but, but in uh, companies and, uh, uh, you know, governments partnering and working together. So, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of the tech industry, I think the industry is up to this challenge. I hope we can dive deeper into some of these points during the discussion and certainly welcome your and others' questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, John, for all these uh, excellent points. Uh, we have just welcomed the European Data Protection Supervisor, Wojciech uh, Wiewiewiewiewski. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so just in case, just to sum up uh, with the points that John, John mentioned, um, John, you mentioned that uh, there was uh, you consider it, it, it's a false choice or a false trade-off to consider there is actually a trade-off between privacy and the use of data. You mentioned the use of uh, partnerships are, as being very important, um, especially, you know, between government and industry at the moment. Uh, the importance for the GDPR um, through the EDPB, for instance, to provide more guidance for companies. And then you insisted on those safeguards uh, that you believe will help in uh, getting things right and getting everyone on board. Uh, now, over to you, um, 
Mr. Vievorowski uh, on behalf of the EDPS and as the EDPS. So we 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 started from this general question of of where do we stand and where do we go? How do we go forward uh, when it comes to the impact of COVID on our on our data protection framework? And there's lots to to share from your perspective. I'm sure you recommended a, a pan-European approach uh, and you've commented on the necessary safeguards and the best practices. So I'm sure our participants would love to hear uh, from you uh, as an opening. The floor is yours. Or you're muted. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for invitation. Thank you very much for possibility to be here and uh, to, to uh, talk with you, to talk with Mr. Miller, to talk with uh, my fellow colleague uh, Uri Kelber, who also joined us uh, uh, already. Uh, but I'd like to send the regards uh, from just the center of the European Union because I live just uh, 300 meters from the Schumann Square where the building of the Commission and the building of the Council are located. And uh, this is uh, the city which, of course, looks strange. Looks strange, it's empty. Uh, it's wonderful weather, which, by the way, is also quite, quite extraordinary for Brussels. And uh, at the same time, the, the, the streets are empty, the uh, buildings of the European institutions are empty, and the people are here, the people are all around, the people are in the specific uh, situation, in the specific uh, circumstances, uh, uh, in the country which has one of the biggest number of uh, uh, cases of coronavirus per capita, uh, also, the number of the people who died is quite high in comparison with the, with the scale of the country itself. So the fear is around, the uh, anxiety, uh, the, the uh, questions, the questions how long it will take, uh, how it will finish, and of course we don't know the answers. We know that there are the proposals given at the moment uh, by uh, different uh, uh, actors, uh, to help uh, in the situation, to, to try to solve it, uh, but we don't know which one of them will be correct. We know that there are the questions which are addressed uh, to the current uh, order, I may say, that we have. Order as far as the, uh, the countries are concerned, the states are concerned, jurisdictions, uh, the fundamental rights, uh, uh, the uh, technology, and uh, also the involvement of the uh, uh, of the commercial community or uh, involvement of the public uh, services, and we ask data protection authorities uh, should face this uh, uh, this uh, challenge as well, and uh, we try to do it uh, as much as uh, it's uh, possible. At the same time, bearing in mind that this is the moment of test, this is the moment that we were trained for in all, all our life that we collected our experiences all our life to say to the people, are we living in the civilization or we are going to finish the civilization and try to fight for survival? So is it fight for survival or is it the civilized civilization and the community that is going to do the things together? When, when I was asking for the pan-European approach, it was not because of the uh, fact that this is the European data protection supervisor who calls for that, uh, but because this is the only way to go back to the to the single market, to go back to the uh, free movement of people. Well, I'm Polish, I live in Brussels, but at the same time I teach in the University of Gdansk in Poland. So we are. I'm right now cut it from the place where I come from, cut it from most of my family, as many people here in Europe. And uh, we cannot go back to normality, whatever normality will mean, without going to, to that uh, with the cooperation with our friends in the other countries, so in the, with friends in the, Euro, uh, in the European Union countries, but not only in the European Union countries, also in other countries of the, uh, of the world. So this cooperation is one of the things that uh, we have to be, bear in mind. When I ask, uh, uh, are we fighting for survival or are we uh, dealing with this uh, civilization and the community? I would like to say that despite the fact that the coronavirus is a game changer, it is not meaning, it does not mean that the world has finished and we are building the new one from the scratch. No, this is actually the world that we try to be prepared for. 
we created the systems that we have right now in the world, no matter if we think about the political system, uh, the, the international organizations or the technical solutions, not only to work uh, when everything is all right, but also in the times of the crisis, the crisis like that. So now we try to uh, say to ourselves, uh, are we then fit for that? I can say that the data protection principles and privacy protection principles seems to be uh, ready for that uh, and uh, seems to be uh, ready to the uh, extraordinary situation that we have the, uh, the, the contact with. And at the same time, we have to give the clear answer that uh, we are standing over the fundamental rights that we developed uh, that to have been created after the incredible crisis we had during the Second World War, after the 50 years of the Cold War uh, here in Europe. So uh, the first uh, message for me would be that uh, uh, the fundamental rights are here to stay. But the question is, what with these tools that we are developing right now to fight with the, uh, with the problems, are they with us to, to stay? If we think about the technological solutions, of course, they will be around. If we create the system of tracking the uh, people, tracking location of the people, it will stay here. If it create the systems to trace uh, the proximity of the people, it will be around. Even if we decide that we don't want to use it further, because we want to come back to the, to the uh, world without uh, the uh, co contact tracing, without the location tracking, uh, the uh, weapons, the tools uh, will be around anyway. So uh, what is then the next uh, challenge? Two next challenge which, which, the challenges which I would like to uh, say about now as the end of uh, this uh, presentation is uh, first something which we start to call immunity passports or the green codes uh, or the green cards uh, that would allow us to go back to normality. There is a, there, there is a proposal to remove uh, uh, one after another the uh, the, the rigid uh, solutions that were proposed so far uh, by the governments, but instead of them to uh, propose something which would uh, uh, give us a little bit more safety, like for example, information that somebody is fit to go back to his job, fit to get in into the uh, Metro, to take part, uh, to take the uh, public transport, uh, to buy the ticket for the train. Do we really want, to do, are we ready for that, uh, that uh, uh, we know who is the immune person, who is the person uh, who uh, is safe for us and who should be our enemy? Is it the way that we want to treat the people around? And the second, uh, the second uh, challenge which we will face this year, I guess in the second part of the year, is the combination of the tools that we have at the moment with the mobile health, with the self-assessment of the health by the people and also reporting of this uh, to some kind of central or decentralized uh, authorities. Uh, that will be another thing uh, that will be proposed. I uh, am afraid uh, that we already have to start uh, to ask ourselves what will be our answer because you will, uh, you will hear the next questions to the government in the week, in the month, and in, the two, in two months time, what more you can propose. Because this crisis is not going to, to finish tomorrow. Thank you very much for your uh, first intervention. I, I do have a couple of follow-up questions, if I may. Uh, you refer to the uh, existence of fundamental rights and, and uh, you know, the, the EU data protection rules as an in existing instrument. Some do argue that maybe there is this um, needed flexibility built in our existing frameworks to be optimal and to work uh, well and, and be able to, to allow various stakeholders to act quickly uh, under the GDPR. Uh, maybe there are some areas of concerns that the GDPR leave unaddressed and that could require more clarity and perhaps even in the review uh, later this year that, that could have an influence. Another part of my question is, you see a lot of member states are, are, have already gone through with their own uh, initiatives, some even you know, breaching some of the rules. Um, so do you believe an EU-wide uh, effort is likely to work under these circumstances in terms of defining legal limits and harmonize really this effort? 
I, I think we should uh, uh, also hear what the data protection authorities in the countries have to uh, have to say about uh, uh, this. But let me start from the second uh, uh, question. Well, the history of United Europe is the history of harmonization. It's the history of the countries which are differing one from another and which have different kind of traffic rules and different kind of uh, plugs uh, uh, for the uh, for the telephones and also which had uh, different uh, different uh, monetary uh, systems and which had uh, different uh, solutions uh, in all uh, kinds of industries uh, and we are generally working on harmonization of that uh, yes there are the solutions right now which have been created in the countries uh, sometimes uh, also on the level of the provinces on the level of the uh, lands uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, so that will be the harmonization as the, uh, uh, as the uh, challenge. But on the other hand, we start to see that without uh, moving across the borders that we have in Europe, uh, we start to come back to the situation before the communities. And this is definitely not the thing uh, that the people are expecting. Even those countries which are not the members of the European Union can understand that this approach should be uh, at least uh, uh, continental. But I strongly believe uh, that we should to go towards the global solutions as well. So uh, at the moment, we are proposing the European solutions, but uh, interoperability of these solutions should be uh, broader than, than Europe only. Uh, uh, is the uh, data protection law fit for this, uh, uh, these purposes? In my opinion, yes. If you look to the uh, law, to the rules which are in the Article Nine of the General Data Protection Regulation about the uh, so-called sensitive data, so data of special kind, including the health data, it also says about the uh, grounds, legal grounds for uh, um, processing this data at the time of the cross-border health uh, uh, threat. Uh, it gives you all the possibility to give the special uh, solutions in the special times. But at the same time, it means that the main principles stay the same. So you should remember what you are doing it for, what are the purposes, whom you are giving the data to. Is it necessary and is it proportional what, what you do? And you have to have the oversight mechanism and you have to think what you will do in the end with this data, because you have to remember that when you say to the, uh, about the person's health, uh, uh, the uh, any anything about the person's health uh, in the open uh, uh, in the open public uh, place, uh, it will stay there forever. It will stay in the internet forever, and no matter what was a good wheel of uh, uh, that, that, that you presented, uh, you will have to find it uh, with the future. But in my opinion, although definitely the practical assessment is necessary. The, the, the situation is uh, fit for uh, purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you uh, in, insisted on the need to strengthen the digital single market as part of this process and really combining uh, tools uh, um, around the central authority. Uh, I also heard your comment about immunity passport. But now turning to uh, Professor Ulrich Kelber, uh, you're the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information and you're live from Germany. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so as a, you're the German data protection watchdog. Um, we know uh, you have some, some thoughts on the interactions between health protection and data protection. John earlier mentioned that there is no such thing, he believes, as a, a trade-off. So we'd, we'd like to hear from you about this and, and of course how you're seeing the various initiatives being put in place uh, and how the current crisis is affecting uh, our uh, existing framework. So the floor is yours, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, and I'm so sorry for being late, uh, even that's my fifth uh, video conference today. Um, I had to struggle somehow to, to log in these days with the, the right data. Um, to all those uh, points, um, important points, um, uh, Wojciech um, uh, mentioned, and I was not uh, able to hear all the good things uh, John said in the beginning. Um, some additional thoughts. The first is um, there are two different um, paths in the future of European privacy policy. The one is people understand that they now see that in a number of digital tools they use privately every day, but now has to use for um, education, for professional occasions, 
um, they don't have a clue about which is secure and privacy friendly. And um, I think there will be a kind of uh, boosting um, these uh, questions um, in the next month. And there is uh, the possibility to, to give guidance on that, um, to develop more privacy friendly European solutions if there is not uh, such uh, from uh, other regions, so like for example with uh, the question of uh, video conferencing um, systems used. Um, and the other one is one which uh, we are used to, that every time there is a situation or some um, professional interest made from the business side or the security side, they try to um, to blame the uh, privacy professionals on being a, um, a hurdle, um, a blockade for this interest. So you have to hear uh, privacy uh, hinders uh, European um, business models to be competitive with the Asian and American uh, competitors. Uh, we hear that we uh, protect criminals because we uh, stop them from collecting every data they are wanting to collect. Um, and now we hear that, um, that data um, protection and privacy um, um, is a blockade for um, um, helping uh, public health. And uh, we, we hear that there should be a, a weakening of, of the rules, sometimes from the European side or sometimes just at the national level. Um, and in the moment you, you, you go um, uh, on the facts on the ground with them and ask them, so which principles you will uh, weaken now? So um, that there has to be a legal base for processing personal data or transparency or taking measures to secure that data. So having a secure app, for example, um, then there is no much um, feedback on that. And to take that at one example, at the beginning of the talking about the um, digital tools um, fighting um, the, uh, the virus, um, they come out with the idea of identifying contacts of infected persons and trying to break the chain of infection. And the, the first idea was to take all those uh, data from the um, cell phone providers to which um, uh, antenna um, your phone has to uh, has been paired and um, they try to blame um, the data protection authorities to to block that attempt to to identify contact persons but in the end we were able to show them that the idea was just the collecting of data but these data are not accurate enough so the idea is not efficient enough and uh, this is um, an uh, experience uh, we have from the past in 99% of all the problems where um, privacy is blamed, in reality, they have problems with their um, being really an, an innovat uh, innovative. And uh, in the remaining 1%, uh, it's just um, a kind of a business model of thing which is not in line with European values. But this will be a, a fight on the third uh, on the third front, beside business models and sec uh, security interests, it's now um, the question of public health. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, that um, you, you raised a few, a few points in your contribution, and uh, it, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, so. You know that uh, on Friday, Google and Apple announced a joint project to enable um, phone-based contact tracing. So it's about allowing uh, users to voluntarily uh, share data using Bluetooth and apps approved by uh, health organizations. And they consulted with uh, government authorities and health authorities. Uh, what are your thoughts on how such initiatives can uh, work as they develop? Are they somehow compatible with government's own initiatives? Is there a way to, to work together? Uh, and I'm thinking also of existing uh, standards or codes that have been developed, like the mouthful um, pan uh, European privacy preserving Proximity Tracing Coalition. Uh, maybe this could work, this could be useful. What are your uh, thoughts on this? Um, 
I think that such a digital tool to support that um, inspection of uh, which which um, persons an infected uh, person was in contact the last days um, could be useful in the end. Uh, and it can be done and it can be installed and deployed privacy friendly. Um, um, we are working on a um, guideline for that as the European Data Protection Board, and there are some ideas from the Commission too um, about the, the principles uh, which has to behind that. Um, even some, uh, a lot of those principles are dealing with the um, idea of trust, trust of the people in such apps to install them and not have uh, um, a handicap when they uh, use that and um, bring their data in that um, search for such uh, change of infection. Um, and this trust can be disturbed if you, um, if someone is um, trying to, to, to press them to install that app, taking the data for other purposes than just that of um, trying to, um, um, see where these change of infections are. Um, this is the, the situation that uh, Google and um, um, Apple came out with that idea of bringing that as part of the operation system as second step, which has to be examined very deeply. And as a first step, giving a kind of an application programming interface uh, makes sense in, uh, in the first move because um, um, so we can um, work around some restrictions of the operating systems, like for example, in iOS with uh, Bluetooth, just uh, low energy, just be used by the active app and not by one in the background. Um, and uh, it can speed up the development of uh, national or European applications. It's fine to have a kind of a competition between such uh, um, apps uh, at the area of being uh, convenient in the use and being privacy friendly. Um, but in the end, um, this um, competition may not uh, lead to a situation where there are 10 or 20 apps which can't interoperate um, um, on the market, but uh, it may be only expressions from the same um, backend. So, um, even people crossing borders or in one society has to uh, really um, detect as many contacts as possible um, to help us um, going online again with uh, our society and just bringing uh, flatten the curve again with digital help. Thank you. Uh, Wojciech, perhaps, uh, what would be your thoughts on this, on this potential collaboration with private sector initiatives, industry initiatives, and the use of this uh, standard, like the PEPP-PT uh, uh, standard? Um, perhaps you can react on, on Professor Kelber's contribution. First of all, I don't think that uh, European Commission or any of the agencies of the European Commission will produce the applications themselves, uh, the applications that should work uh, uh, all over Europe. I, most, uh, I rather think that uh, there will be the framework uh, uh, construction prepared that will enable the interoperability of these uh, uh, apps and at the same time uh, protection of uh, the, the rights, but also protection of the, um, of the market itself. Uh, and the applications will be developed uh, mainly on the national level or on local level. Although I understand that this second phase of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Apple Google project uh, may also help those countries that didn't develop uh, uh, such a solution uh, so far. Uh, would it be uh, uh, would it be the the solution which is proposed by Apple or Google, or would it be uh, rather more close to uh, uh, what is proposed right now by the scientific community? Well, first of all, we have many uh, um, uh, um, many initiatives which we have to understand what is the difference between them and what are the similarities between them. Uh, we have to understand which of them are proposing the protocols to be used, which are of the, which are of them are preparing the uh, environments uh, for the interoperability, and which of them are the proposals of the applications. So I, I don't, I'm not definitely the person to choose uh, 
which solutions uh, should be in use. But definitely we are, as data protection authorities, those who should assess uh, the proposals which are given and to, uh, um, to uh, tell which should be the minimum requirements uh, and which shall be the uh, suggested solutions. Because this is not true that we will be able to propose uh, the only best solution that will exist in the world. Uh, there are definitely some suggestions that we can make on where, where should we go with the, with the solution. And there are the minimum requirements that we should uh, uh, set as the data protection authorities. But we have to remember that at the same time, we have to think about the competition on the market. We have to think about the, uh, the, the uh, position of the state authorities in this uh, field and also uh, the uh, uh, the uh, part, part of the fundamental rights that we are talking about are also the rights which are connected with the uh, with making business in in Europe. So this is uh, uh, something which we cannot uh, harm with the solutions that are that are uh, that are favored by the European uh, institutions. At the same time, I have to say that all the situations where uh, big providers of the uh, of the operations uh, operation systems uh, uh, like uh, Android and iOS uh, are making them interoperable are generally seen as the uh, good path uh, for the future uh, for the for the future industry. Thank you. Um, just a follow up question on, on that, uh, including from one of our participants, uh, Niels Hulen from IBM. Um, so today the European Commission is publishing the toolbox for applications and anonymized uh, location data usage. So how can uh, you make sure, can, can, can we make sure that uh, both these guidelines and recommendations align and avoid you know, their divergence? Uh, European Commission is uh, seeking the consultation from the European Data Protection Board. Uh, European Data Protection Board is also preparing its own guidelines uh, uh, to, to be uh, published in the nearest future. This is the same group of people who is working on that. Uh, this is the same group of people who is uh, uh, both making the consultation for the uh, Commission and who, who is preparing the solutions which uh, will be then uh, proposed in the Member States and in the EU institutions. We are involved in it. Uh, uh, together with uh, with Ulrich, we've been taking part yesterday in the uh, meeting of the European Data Protection Board, uh, and uh, our uh, employees, the employees of our institution, are taking part in the works of the subgroup of the European Data Protection Board, uh, which are going on, uh, let's say, on permanent basis. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to get back to to you, John. Uh, you probably have some reactions uh, to what your fellow panelists shared, uh, but also uh, I could ask you uh, a general question on who do you think can be uh, trusted uh, when it comes to managing the data at EU level? Uh, should it be governments, the European Commission, the World Health Organization, third parties? Um, so, for is yours. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Um, I, you know, I think on that on that last point about trust, that you know, as I mentioned in, in my opening comments, it's really so. Uh, it, it's really such a critical component um, of, of this conversation. Um, and uh, I mean, I think I think the answer is um, we 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 need to number one, all the, all those um, different stakeholders that you mentioned. Uh, need to work together, and, and we need to figure out a way to 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 trust um, uh, each other. Uh, really, I, I mean, it's not. It's, this is not a situation where where just the companies or just the uh, you know uh, European Commission or the European Data Protection Board uh, should be uh, exploring um, solutions in, in isolation, right? Um, so I'd be very interested to see what this toolbox says. But the you know the point about um, uh, needing uh, alignment in, in what the recommendations are is, is, is really critical. And I think the best way to, to make sure that, that we get there is to actually have uh, some stakeholder uh, inputs on the front end and, and working together, you know, whether we're talking about the data scientists and, um, you know, developers from the companies or the medical and public health uh, officials, uh, you know, we really need to understand what the, what the actual needs are. To, to data, and um, you know, we, we need to 
I think above all else, um, uh, it, transparency is, is going to be a real key here because I mean there there may or may not be a you know quote unquote perfect solution that that can be developed um, expeditiously. And clearly, this is a public health crisis. We we maybe can't can't wait for the perfect solution. But as long as we're being as transparent as possible about what we're what 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 we're doing and and what's being proposed, I think that'll go a long way toward you know, establishing public trust in, in those proposed solutions. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Professor Kelber, maybe you can uh, um, uh, pick up on one of uh, some of the things that John said, but I also uh, wanted to, to get back to this transparency um, aspect, which John mentioned. Um, that's indeed, I think, how we can address the uncertainty of the public about the current procedures at the moment. So how do we get them how do we get citizens on board? How do we get them to use applications voluntarily? Uh, do you even expect self-reporting models will be adopted by uh, European citizens because you know critical mass adoption is, is quite an important factor in the success of those applications? Um, and one of the participants here mentioned, uh, just posted a question on how do we ensure inclusivity on contact tracing? Some people can afford smartphones and contribute and benefit. Uh, and some others, you know, for some others that may be uh, more difficult for children and el elderly, for instance. And this question was from Simon Hanya from Uber. So I know I've just listed quite a few uh, points here. I'd like your reaction, uh, uh, Professor Kelber. We cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah. So sorry for that. So the uh, question of transparency has to go far beyond uh, just the transparency from um, the processors um, towards the data protection authorities. We, we can have that uh, inside, but um, to have that transparency uh, through the public um, to show them what is really happening with the data, how the data are processed, where they are stored, um, why are, which uh, data are necessary, is the solution effective, and thing, uh, things like this. Um, um, I'm trying to, um, to convince all uh, leading politicians back home that the question of voluntarily um, installing such an app, voluntarily using such an app, is uh, a basic um, for, the, for getting accurate data, which are not biased, even if you are trying to see where are um, chains of infections. And uh, a part of that is um, giving not exclusively benefits for using of that. That means only if you use one of those apps, you may enter a building. Um, maybe there will be a time where um, governments decide that there has to be a kind of a proof that you are trying to avoid infections or things like that, but then there has to be um, alternatives to the usage of such an app. Because if this pressing is there, then we have uh, some ethical problems, but we can have some uh, data protection problems too with the legal base um, of the processing of the data. So um, all of those um, um, governments trying to get such a, a tool in their hands has to look out for that, that meaning transparency, voluntarily use, and um, being absolutely clear that there will be no change for the purpose of that data. Uh, and that comes uh, from, from the big side to the small one. We have the situation now in Germany that some um, um, uh, local policy um, forces takes the list of infected persons with the argument that they have to protect their uh, policeman when they go to the home of infected person. But in reality, we know that there uh, is only a small percentage of all infected persons are really tested positively. And so this uh, kind of uh, protecting has to be the same going to every single household these days, to every single flat, um, and so this is an absolutely unlegal and unnecessary spreading um, of uh, sensitive data in the hands of hundreds and thousands of people 
Um, and such things have to be stopped if you really want to have uh, those willingness, which is uh, shown in polls, where 60, 70 percent uh, are saying, I, I am willing to install and to use such an app if they show me it's safe mm -hmm. and it's effective. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, actually, you mentioned quite a few safeguards that are important to keep in mind. And one of them is really this anonymization uh, idea uh, and politicians then, uh, you know, uh, have been insisting that the data sets will be anonymized. That means for those who may not be familiar with the term that customers or people, individual identities are, are being scrubbed out. But I've got a, a question from um, Vincent Manoncourt from Politico, uh, who would like to ask uh, to ask you and, and Reuter as well, uh, whether you agree with uh, the Dutch Data Protection uh, Authority supervisor who said that the, the telecom data being used to track the spread of, of the virus cannot be anonymized. Let me answer this uh, question. And I would like to ask uh, the uh, those who are re reporting on what's going on, uh, to try to uh, approach uh, constructively also to the answers that are given by the data protection authorities. Uh, because we, we, we tried to find what is this incredible difference that is stressed by the press between what was said by our Dutch colleague uh, and what was said by the other colleagues in the data protection uh, community uh, about the anonymization. Uh, because actually what uh, the uh, data, what the Dutch authority said uh, is technically true. If you think about anonymization of the big results of telecom data in the 100% precise way that you will not be able to re-identify the person again, then it's not possible. It's not possible. But GDPR also is not saying about the full absolute anonymization of each of the data, but is saying about the situation where you cannot re-identify the, the data using the normal means, using the, the, the uh, reasonable means. Uh, so uh, we were asking, for, uh, for example, that since the anonymization is not possible to the very end with the telecom data, we should use another safeguard, which is, for example, uh, the uh, aggregation. But if you ask me, is the anonymized and aggregated data absolutely re-identifiable, I will tell you, well, of course, once again, not, because there was a question what the egg was the, the technique of the aggregation. Are we talking about the data which is collected in the center of the big city or in the rural area? However, you will, uh, you will uh, anonymize and aggregate the data from the main uh, forest in which only the one forester lives. Uh, will, it will be always the data of this forester. And uh, um, uh, the, the, the there is a difference between the technical impossibility of doing something to the very end and something which we would say, uh, which we would call effective anonymization and which should be taken into consideration. So that's why, for example, when the EDPS was giving the advice to the commission about the data taken from the telecoms, we said that it's not enough that you have anonymized data to not to use the principles which are in the GDPR. You anyway should, talk, should, should decide about the, uh, about, about, the save, about the purpose for you to use the data. You still have to decide who will have an access to the data and you, what you will do with the raw data after the whole, uh, whole event, because there is still a technical possibility that the data might be randomized. Uh, sorry, identified because there is somebody in the world who has the 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 quantum of data which will make it uh, personal again. Uh, the same way we were struggling with uh, uh, the British commissioner with Liz Denham to find out what is the difference between our positions. I mean, ICO's position and EDPS position that were uh, that were stressed by one of the. Uh, newspapers in the UK who said who said that uh, Liz was not presenting some of the safeguards that were presented by, by the EDPS. Actually, our position was exactly the same. The question has been different that was asked, so the answer was uh, uh, differently given. Let's try to find the situations where, where we have the same approach to this, uh, to the, or, or uh, uh, compatible approach to the situation because we need the cooperation. We don't need to stress the unexistent uh, uh, differences. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kelber, did you want to come in on that? 
um, the original question being about the Dutch uh, Data Protection Authority. Oh, I'm mute. Sorry for that, 100% uh, the same um, position um, as my colleague. Okay, great. Um, I have a few questions from the audience that I, I'd like to, to get back to uh, regularly. So we have uh, Duji Standerford, uh, European correspondent at Warren Communications News, asking, going back to the issue of making uh, application use voluntarily versus uh, mandatory, can it also be argued that mandatory use might be more effective so long as the EU privacy laws are respected, such as, you know, we've named a few transparency, proportionality, necessity, etc. Maybe for Wojciech, you would like to react or? Could we just go mandatory, basically? I don't, I don't know if I can uh, answer it in, in all the circumstances that would ever be. I'm uh, definitely in favor of having the uh, voluntary approach as the, uh, uh, as the uh, ground. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, mandatory solutions uh, should be used only in the situation when it's absolutely necessary. And it's hard for me to, to uh, imagine which uh, solution which has been proposed so far is good enough to be the mandatory one. Uh, uh, let's look at the examples in, in the member states. As a EDPS, I should not name the country, I should not uh, name the, 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 the solution, but we already have some countries which introduce the mandatory uh, uh, applications. And uh, those rules about mandatory applications uh, or a draft of these uh, rules uh, always include uh, the different ways of dealing with the uh, with the um, exemptions. In my family, in my closest family, out of six persons, there are only two who are using the smartphones. Four are not using the smartphones. Two of them are using the other telephones, but they are not smartphones. So there's no possibility to, to put the app, to, to put the app on the, on that. Then we have two children, and one of them is not using telephone at all. The other one was uh, is using telephone time from time. But we are not also ready to to, to uh, decide that this is the reason for which the child should be with the smartphone all time uh, all the time. So uh, we have to find what are the uh, what are the possible excuses. Then we have to uh, think: uh, is really the telephone telling us? Uh, who is communicating. Well, my private telephone uh, is not registered on me. I'm using the telephone, which is registered for my wife. And theoretically, when you look to the uh, data, this data is theoretically the data of my wife. So what does it mean that somebody has, uh, that, that, that somebody uh, has to use the, the solutions uh, manda mandatory? Does it mean that we have to create another register of the possessed uh, uh, equipment. Uh, we also can uh, find that the, the solutions which are quite normal for the um, and for the cultural background that we live in will not work in the other countries. That's why the uh, the, the uh, tracking uh, uh, according to the, uh, uh, the telephone uh, data in uh, during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone it didn't work because there was a completely different way of using the telephones in the countries like that. I'll start with that. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, based on what you said, whether uh, Professor Calver, you could react on this idea of data donation or data altruism. Um, you know, there's been this discussion uh, from the, the Robert Koch Institute that launched this app to donate, to allow users to, to donate data uh, with their fitness devices. Would you think it's a promising type of scheme? Um, I was a little bit surprised by the introduction of that app. Um, some days before that, um, when we talked with the um, institute, we were we thought that we are we're talking about the uh, the tracing app, and then there was the new one, which was uh, pretty hard in the public debate because a lot of persons were surprised, and there was a kind of um, not realizing that that is not the app everyone is talking about the tracing app. So. Uh, we have to, to teach that uh, in the public again. Um, uh, I was not glad with the name donation because that's a very different situation. Normally a donation is something you gave um, 
and which you no longer have on your side and which is, can be used one time. And uh, here is the data is shared. Um, you can withdraw your consent on the sharing of that data. Um, and there should be a, a, a absolutely clear purpose for using and processing that data. But uh, as we see, there's a number of people willing to share such kind of um, um, pseudonym and in the end, um, at the long run, um, anonym data uh, for that purpose. That is um, pretty fine to see. And I think that there will be much more and a higher percentage um, if there's uh, it's coming on on the um, tracing app, but um, besides the idea that um, those who pick a mandatory approach has to prove that there is no more privacy friendly way to reach the same goal, that will be hard for them, um, and um, they don't not only have to show that uh, because it's written down in the GDPR, but they have to to bring that argument um, for their own people to show we are not asking for some much, uh, something which can be done differently. And the second thing, I, I can't imagine how such a mandatory approach has to be enforced in a liberal um, society. So. Show me your smartphone. Oh, did you switch on Bluetooth? Did you have the last update of the operating system? Why is your um, um, power supply uh, uh, below 20% and Bluetooth is not longer working? Is that unlawful from that um, situation? Uh, where do you have to take the, um, the, the cell phone with you to every single uh, point, even if uh, going around in a flat or in, in an office building? Even if you go to the restroom, um, that's ridiculous to, uh, to really think that you can do the same things in Europe like you can do in China. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to go with a final round of reactions, uh, including some questions I had still in mind and some questions from our participants, which were, were excellent. Um, one question would be for Wojciech. Um, uh, so, we are, I think, all curious to know how the current debate and situation will impact the, the GDPR review and adequacy decisions. Uh, what about, you know, the technological tools we're using right now? Uh, how will, if they may be, become part of the, of the toolbox, how can we uh, build that into the, the data protection framework if that's even the, um, the intention? So I'd like to have your, your final thoughts and, and if you could share some of, of that with us, that would be great. I'm afraid I don't know the answers to, to, to some of the questions that you gave uh, because the question, the first question, how it will work with the uh, review of the GDPR. Well, first of all, of all, we have to remember that review does not mean revision. Yeah, These this words do not mean the same. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't think it's right now the, the good time to discuss uh, about the changes which are necessary in the legis legislation. Uh, because of the, uh, the, the coronavirus crisis, because we don't know actually where the, uh, what will be the effect of this uh, crisis, what will be uh, the uh, outcome of what's going on. Uh, I don't think that we are at the right moment to uh, make the decisions, but what we absolutely have to do is to report each and every action which we are doing uh, uh, as the public authorities and as a business uh, fighting with this crisis, because there will be somebody after us who will come and who will have to learn on the experiences of those who are working right now. So transparency is one of the first words to be used on all sides of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, discussion here. Well, uh, I, I always remember the people who during the Second World War in the worst possible situations that uh, existed there, decided to report what was going on, to keep the archives. How important is the Regenblum archive from Ghetto? How important were the, the scientific works which were done in the middle of, the, of this incredible crisis of the whole civilization? Yes, we do, we should report at the moment. That's something that we, that we have to do. Uh, you ask me what will be the uh, what will be the impact of that on the um, uh, on the adequacy decisions? Absolutely no clue. 
once again, we will have to answer ourselves uh, uh, how the uh, how different jurisdictions uh, uh, cope with uh, keeping the rules they had. So that's a question which definitely Europe will be asking to the, uh, uh, the European Union will be asking to the, the countries outside, those who have the data protection uh, uh, adequacy at the moment and those who are seeking for that. But also these are the things which the, with these countries will ask Europe all about. They will ask, you want to assess our adequacy? You want to assess our adequacy to the rules? Yeah. Try first to look how did you keep the principles that you wanted to uh, now propose to the world. Thank you, Wojciech, uh, very much. Uh, John, I'd like to ask uh, if you could give us a final contribution. I know uh, what was said packs a punch. Uh, I'm sure you have some reactions on behalf of industry, especially as you mentioned, certainty is, is major uh, for industry at the moment. Uh, sure. Uh, th thanks very much, Elaine. And, and yeah, there, there's certainly a lot to a lot to react to. Um, you know, just really quickly. Uh, you know, I mean, a couple of things. Um, you know, we were talking a, a lot about um, uh, anonymous and, and, and aggregated data. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, um, having both flexibility to consider. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's there's really a, a pretty broad array of, of data between. Uh, fully anonymous data and 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 personal data that doesn't have any protections, and there are a lot of different degrees of pseudonymization and de-identification and 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 protections that that can be built in. And and I think that having the flexibility to use some of these other types of of, of data is something that that should be a part of the con of the conversation. Um, uh, you know, secondly, uh, you know, about the, the points about uh, inclusivity, I, I think it I think it relates certainly to the point about interoperability. And I think we want to try to figure out a way. I mean, if, if, if any of these apps are going to be effective, we certainly are going to need to, to figure out a way to bring as many people into the tent, uh, so to speak, as, as possible. Uh, you know, I, I would suggest that we, we, we do have to start somewhere, though. And I mean, starting with you know, the iOS and Android operating systems, which, which allows potentially, you know, a reach of something like 3 billion phones is, is definitely a, you know, a good start. Um, you know, I, and I think the, the, the one other thing uh, also, also to mention uh, on, on this point about, uh, you know, data alt altruism and, and donation, I mean, I think it comes back to, to trust uh, again uh, and, and, and transparency. Um, you know, and, and it ties into this question of mandatory versus voluntary as well. I mean, obviously, the, the more trust there is, the, the more likely that individuals are going to, to want to donate their, their data to, to do this and participate in, in some of these, these programs. Um, uh, you, you know, I think the, the, the figuring out in partnership uh, companies and public health officials and other stakeholders, the, the best way to do that uh, is, is, is really important um, and, and you know even though as the EDPB has pointed out you know in a situation of emergency uh, you know it's a, it's, a, it's a legal condition where, where some legitimate restrictions on freedoms may, may be necessary um, you know ideally we are able to do this and have it be effective in a, in a voluntary uh, way and I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just close there thanks. Thank you, John. Yeah, we're a little bit over time, but I'd like to uh, to ask you, Professor Calvert, to have a final word on, uh, well, you, the role of data protection authorities certainly has evolved very quickly the last few weeks. So I wanted to know uh, if you have some thoughts on that and as well, what are we learning that uh, will outlive uh, the COVID crisis for our data protection frameworks? I think we've, we've shown as data protection authorities that we can handle the job even now in the crisis. We are restricted and uh, we can't uh, meet each other. Um, some of us uh, have even um, sent a lot of people uh, working um, from home, um, but still we are um, in a very close contact, um, trying to exchange each other about uh, national um, approaches, um, working on papers for a uh, European-wide um, guidance, um, on such topics uh, and uh, doing even some copy paste if someone has an excellent idea to inform the public, um, then uh, others just take that um, and do the same uh, back in their country. So 
uh, from my point of view, the last um, two weeks uh, show uh, an extra ordinary uh, um, work of the uh, DPAs, um, counseling a number of initiatives, um, guiding them the right way to bring in privacy by, um, by design, privacy by default, and in some uh, special um, occasions, even um, uh, guiding them from a way which wouldn't be effective in the end to one which is uh, much more privacy friendly and much more uh, effective uh, in the uh, way to protect public health. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you all. Um, so clearly to wrap up very briefly, what's, what's happening is clearly likely going to impact data protection and, and expectations of, uh, of privacy, but also beyond the role of governments, of data protection authorities and uh, their relationship with uh, citizens. So this debate we just had really fits into a bigger picture, which uh, I'm sure we will all uh, closely follow. I'd like to thank uh, our distinguished speakers. It was a privilege for me to moderate uh, this conversation. I'd like to thank ITI and all participants for making today's uh, conversation happen. Uh, and I wish you all to stay safe, uh, stay positive and stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Take care of you. Great job moderating. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.